Uh, today's speaker is Douglas Rushkoff, uh, winner of the first Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity. He's an author, teacher, documentarian who focuses on, on the way people, uh, culture, and institutions create, share, and influence each other's values. He sees media as the landscape where this interaction takes place, and literacy as the ability to participate consciously in it. His, be his ten best-selling books range on topics from new media and popular culture to religion to business. Uh, he writes fiction and nonfiction. As I said, he's an award-winning documentarian who has uh, written and hosted two award-winning frontline documentaries. Uh, the Merchants of Cool looked at the influence of corporations on youth culture and the persuaders about the cluttered landscape of marketing and new efforts to overcome uh, consumer resistance. Um, he, one of his books, Open Source Democracy, uh, is what he's here to talk about today. I first read the book um, about two years ago, uh, downloaded it for free online, so it's available. Um, I, I immediately recognized the potential in some of the ideas that he expressed there and uh, got really excited about it. I was a little skeptical of the possibility of um, some of these ideas actually being implemented in the political world that we live in. Um, today, I have hope that just, uh, you know, maybe some of these changes can come about. Douglas Rushkoff. So, hi, I, I wrote some notes, but it's kind of, it's been really hard to prepare, uh, prepare talks or even prepare writing that's going to happen in the future because reality seems to be changing quite rapidly. I'm, I'm in the midst of rewriting a book that I finished last year that was really about the coming economic meltdown. And then, obviously, because the economic meltdown happened, I've got to change a lot of future tenses to past tense. <laughs> and all my sort of crescent notions are now just history. Um, so it changes. Uh, it changes quickly. In, in my early days, when I was in my late 20s and early 30s writing books about internet culture and cyber culture, um, I actually had my first real book. It was called Siberia. It was canceled by Bantam in 1991 because they thought the internet would be over by 1992 when the book came out. <laughs> yeah, at the time, the publishing world thought it was like... Um, uh, CB radio. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that. CB, Breaker Breaker. It was this thing. Everyone went to Radio Shack and bought CBs, and there was a couple of movies about, you know, Channel 9 or whatever. And, uh, and it did die down. But um, the internet turned out to be a little bit more, and, and those of us who were laughed out of cocktail parties for suggesting that people might be using email someday have been proven right um, on the one hand, but uh, proven wrong on, on, on another. I mean, I'm sure you guys in this course by now have sort of looked at the trajectory of the internet and some of the high hopes that its early pioneers had for a new social tool through which people are going to organize and share knowledge and create a new culture unencumbered by the top-down uh, hegemony of broadcast elite capitalist culture. And of course, what we ended up with with the internet was a new tool for corporations to have, uh, to breathe life into corporations and to conglomerate media. And we watch, you know, whether it's Murdoch by MySpace or Google by YouTube or even talking to the people who started MySpace and YouTube and find out what their aspirations were all along were really less about helping people share their visions of the world and more about getting to IPO before they're 25. Um, it makes you question how values, how values change. And then today, I mean, today's a tricky day for those of us who have uh, grown accustomed to 20, 25 years of cynicism. You know, the, the original Generation X, of which Obama is a part. I mean, Generation X, really, these are people in their mid to late 40s. You know, uh, Richard Linkletter, who made Slacker, Doug Copeland, who wrote uh, uh, Gen X, uh, me, Barack, uh, uh, 
Matt Groening, Groening, however you say it. I mean, these are these are the original Generation X, the people who came up, Mike Judge, people who came up with Beavis and Butthead and and Bart Simpson and uh, um, and looked at the world that was bequeathed to us by the Boomers as a a set of hollow brands, you know, of, of mythologies, whether they were political parties or corporations or ideologies that we were supposed to sign on to, and we rejected them because we saw how, how vacant and ultimately manipulative they were. Mainstream culture, which was really marketing culture, was the same thing through the, really from the 70s through the 90s, um, looked at this generation as apathetic, uninvolved, and dead. That we are a generation who doesn't care about anything. When, in fact, if you looked at rates of social volunteerism and, and, and charitable acts and all, they were higher than they were during the Peace Corps era during the early 90s. So there was a kind of a disconnect. There were a lot of people who cared a lot about the real world and didn't see how joining a group or joining a thing or a movement or a company was going to promote any of the, the positive change that needed to occur. And so they dropped out, we dropped out, but not necessarily in the way that, that Timothy Leary might have been suggesting to drop out. For us, dropping out was dropping in to the real world. It just seemed to the, the, uh, the hierarchy that had been set up and, and that had been working so fastidiously to capture each new demographic that was coming through the pike, all of a sudden, here was a generation that was not responding to the standard stimulus. Right? The advertising wasn't working on kids in their 20s in the 90s, in the early 90s. So they were confused, and they, they just kind of gave up on this group and decided they'd work on Gen Y instead and let us pass through that sort of snake's digestive tract as that sort of tennis ball of unattended people. And not that we had heroes, but if we had anti-heroes, it would have been people sort of like Kurt Cobain. And Kurt Cobain's suicide, he was the guy, in, in the head man of this big band called Nirvana from, from the old days. And um, part of the point of Nirvana and the, the grunge movement that Nirvana was, was uh, kind of the poster child for was to make music that connected with a lot of people but avoided the kind of rock and roll celebrity hierarchy, masturbatory, guitar playing, hero worship of a standard rock and roll band. And really, although he was also a, a clinically depressed person, Cobain was really incapable of preventing himself from becoming what his label made of him. He became a rock legend, a rock hero, another Jim Morrison, another really boomer era hero in charge of a movement, and that, that didn't work. Yes, it was irresponsible for him to blow himself up, but um, it, it, I, see how, I see how that happened. And every night that I'm upset that I haven't become a bestseller on the order of a Malcolm Gladwell, I'm also thankful that I haven't become a bestseller on the order of Malcolm Gladwell, because that would mean, at least in this society, that would mean I've done something really, really wrong. What, what we're looking at now is a really interesting moment in culture, and I think the, the not only the most convenient way to talk about it, but probably the most accurate way to talk about it is in the context of computers and society. You know, what, I'm, not, I'm not a media determinist. I don't say, oh, you know, we got, uh, I mean, I do say it, but I don't really mean it. Uh, <laughs> we got text, you know, we got, the, we got the alphabet, and therefore we got Judaism. We got the printing press, and therefore we got... Um, um, the invention of the individual and centralized currency. Um, but there are uh, media breakthroughs, media technology breakthroughs that um, parallel great societal shifts. And they provide, at the very least, really cogent metaphors 
for what's going on. And if we give ourselves a little wiggle room, they also um, give us a really neat and direct line to draw, a nice cause and effect line between um, something that happened to us and how, how we respond to it. So I look at the current financial meltdown, which really is the big, the big story of today. And we, I would look at 9-11 this way or whatever, whatever the last few stories are in the next few. But the financial meltdown that we're in today really is the second shoe of the dot-com bust. That's actually what's going on now. This is the dot-com bust. When the dot-com bust actually happened, we found a safety valve. We found a new poster child for investment capital, which was real estate and a housing boom and a new way to lend money. But now that that's failed, the real dot-com bust is happening. And it does take this long. It really wasn't going to happen two years after AOL peaked. It happens 10 years after AOL peaked, when now we're picking up the pieces of a world that had just too much capital floating around in it and not enough things to invest that capital in. From a bigger standpoint, and this is the really, really big one, and, and if you get this, I contend you get what's going on. From a, a bigger perspective, we as both a society and an economy are still incapable of contending with value creation from the periphery. We, we are incapable of letting people create value from the bottom up. We only know how to receive values and how to create financial value from the top down. And that's really because for 400 years, we've been doing it that way. Right? Before 400 years, we didn't do it that way. But really for 400 years, since the Renaissance, we have been, all of the tools that we use, all of the media that we use are biased towards centralized top-down value creation and idea dissemination and a way from bottom up and outside in idea creation and idea dissemination. And that's why it's so hard for our economy to work right now. That's what the dot-com bust was about. The dot-com bust was really big, giant corporations that were used to doing business in a certain way trying to deal with technologies that were intrinsically bottom up outside in, that worked the other way. And the models that they use to make money, which are really models of scarcity, they know how to make money by making something scarce, creating a market for something, and then selling it. How do you do that with something that's in abundance? It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And that's the thing is, and this is what economists are going to have to learn, or they're just going to have to quit and go away, which is fine. <laughs> is that it actually does work. And if you look at a majority of human history, that's the way, the thing we like to call economics, but is actually just commerce, that's the way commerce works. So what I want to do, and then I want to have a real, a real discussion about where we're at. What I want to do is give you just a little bit of the way I see that 400 years happening and why things got tilted this way and then what the opportunity is now and why I think we're probably incapable of seizing upon that opportunity, but what we, what we would and should do if we have the chance. Okay, the Renaissance. We are taught that the Renaissance was this great, great time, right? That there were these dark ages when everybody was living with rats and eating each other and, and dying of plagues and stuff like this. And then the Renaissance came and sort of civilized people. We got the notion of the individual and all these great Greek ideas came back and, and we got you know, Florence and wealth and paintings and perspective and statues and Michelangelo and Vesuvian man and all this great stuff and that led directly to the reinvention of democracy and the city-state and the polis and the demos and the great nations that we have and the industrial age and technology and wonderful, wonderful stuff. What the Renaissance really was, what 
what was really happening there was a deal. It was really a deal that was being struck between a waning aristocracy, really a dying, a dying class of people. Right? The aristocracy, the ultra-wealthy, were becoming poorer and the rise of a new merchant class, the people we call the bourgeois, the middle class. Right? Merchants were making all this money and the aristocracy was getting poorer and poorer. I mean, that's why classy clothing is considered non-gaudy, right? You're not supposed to be too showy if you're a very classy person. Why? Because back then, the rich, the, the, the aristocracy couldn't afford clothing as ornate and as garish as the middle class. So they changed fashion, and they decided, okay, no, no, no. Really rich people wear conservative clothes. But they did that really just because they couldn't afford the bourgeois stuff and the gold lilies and the carriages. They decided that was gauche. That's when that whole thing got started. <laughs> but what they did was they saw the merchant class, right? The merchant class had all these companies, right? They started, they were traveling around and doing all this stuff. And there were a few that had kind of risen to the top, a few families of these merchant companies who were doing the best at that time. And like anyone in business, those people are scared that someone else is going to come along and do it better, right? And meanwhile, the aristocracy is scared that these people, these ultra-rich families, are actually more powerful than we are. So what did they do? They made a deal. And this is the birth of the corporation. What they did was they created contracts. These were charters, on-paper charters that said, your company has now earned a monopoly on the industry that you're in. So you know how even on, on tea today you'll see, you know, buy Mad Her Majesty the Queen's tea maker or Her Majesty's shirt maker and coat maker? It's just like that for British East India Trading Company. You are Her Majesty's go kill brown people in South America company, right? That's your thing, right? And here's the contract. You have a monopoly over that. In return for that monopoly, you're going to give me shares. This is, again, a new thing. You're going to give me shares in that company. I don't have to operate the company, I have no liability to the company, but I have a piece of that company. So it's in my interest to keep your monopoly, and it's in your interest to keep me king. Why? Because I've got the monop you've got your monopoly with me. As long as me or my kids are in power, your company is the exclusive monopoly company on that industry. That's what, that's what corporatism really was about. That's, and that's the way, really, corporations are still nominally created today. They're chartered by a state into being. Now, in order for this to work, a whole bunch of other Renaissance innovations were developed to support this relationship, right? To support a king and to support corporations who are actually now doing all sorts of long-distance work. I'm a corporation. I live here in, in London with the king or in Paris with the queen. But now I own cotton over here, cotton over there, cotton over there. Right? So I now need financial systems that are going to be biased towards a big sort of Walmart-like company doing operations very far away from home. And what did they do? This is late Middle Ages. They said, look, all these towns out there are creating value for themselves. And these people are wealthy. Late Middle Ages was actually a great time. Look in the real history. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Late Middle Ages, England, women were taller than at any time in England until the late 1970s, early 1980s. They were that healthy. People worked three or four days a week, had four meals a day, highest calorie counts. I mean, they were well off. Life expectancy was down because people still died of shit. We don't die of today. But um, these were healthy people who had a lot of time off, a lot of time for reading. They were very, very wealthy. They were so wealthy. There was so much extra money floating around that towns built cathedrals. Look at Chartres, for example. You go there. How did a little town like that build this? We all assume, oh, well, the Vatican must have sent them money, right? No, the Vatican didn't send money to build these cathedrals. Little towns built their own cathedrals. Why? Because they had a very different financial system. They used local currencies instead of centralized currencies. They used pre-Renaissance local currencies. Now, the way local currencies worked is very different from the way currency works today. Local currencies, and think of it just like a different piece of software, a different program that is biased towards different behaviors and different conclusions, right? The money we use is just one kind of money. The kind of money they used worked like this. 
you'd be out in the fields, you'd get a whole bunch of grain, you'd have your harvest, you'd bring it into the grain store, he'd weigh your wheat or your corn, whatever it was, I guess not corn or millet, whatever they grew back there, and then he'd give you a receipt for the amount of grain that you put in his grain store. So if I brought 500 pounds of stuff, now I have a receipt for 500 pounds of grain at Joe's grain store. And this receipt I can now spend. I could tear off 100 pounds. Will you give me a horse for this 100 pounds? Will you give me this? Because you know that there's 100 pounds of grain attached to this receipt. You can either take the grain or you trade it to someone else. Now you can get, so this is real money. This is not barter. This is money that's redeemable for grain back at that grain store. Now the difference in bias between this money and ours is this money lost value over time. Why? Because the grain store, the guy storing the grain had to be paid. Right, he's keeping the grain for you. And also because you lost some grain to rats, to moisture, to mold. So every year, this money might lose, say, 10%. So my grain store money, which was $100, $100 now, 100 pounds of grain, becomes 90, then 80, then 70. What does that bias the currency to do? Hot potato, right? You're gonna spend it as quickly as possible. You don't wanna be left holding the money, you wanna reinvest the money as quickly as possible. So money, Instead of sitting in someone's savings account, every pound of grain dollar that's released ends up circulating a whole lot in the local economy, leading to what? Lots of employment, lots of reinvestment. People reinvested in their windmills. They did preventative maintenance. Things worked. And they had so much extra money that they needed to invest, they said, let's build cathedrals. Why? Because they loved God? No. They said, let's build cathedrals because this is a way of investing in our children and grandchildren's future because now our town will have a tourist attraction. Pilgrim, pilgrims will come and spend their money in our town. And it worked, right? People still go to Shark. The kids, the kids of the kids of the kids of Shark and wherever they are, are doing well because of their great, 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 great grandparents' foresight. Now the king says, what good does this money do me? Zip, right? This money doesn't do him any good. The kings invented long distance currency, which you still need it. Right, centralized long distance currency, redeemable in gold. Why? Because if you want to buy something from Florence when you live in Paris, does some guy in Florence want a receipt for grain stored in a Florence grain bin? Not exactly. Right? That's not useful to him. So he wants a long distance currency. And that was what was used by merchants for long distance trade. And long distance currency, like our currency, was lent into existence. Right? The king lends 100 pounds they call them pounds, whatever, 100 units of gold into existence, you've got to pay him back and pay him back at interest. What the kings did was they decided to make local currency illegal and to force everybody to use coin of the realm for their transactions. So now, when I want to, when I make grain and I want to get, what was I going to buy, a wagon part or a horse? I've got to now go make my grain, get someone to give me gold for it, or I've got to go borrow gold from the king in order to do a transaction with him. So my, me and my neighbor can no longer interact directly. I can't create value for him and he can't create value for me. I have to create value for the king and he has to create value for the king and then the king will give us a means to exchange. I mean, do you see that? That's a big, big difference. Right? And all the technologies, we could talk about a zillion of them, of that era from you know, the printing press on, all really were biased towards the creation of values, the dissemination of ideas happening through not just intermediaries, but through a central authority. Right? Things were either coin of the realm or they were worthless. And I would argue that played all the way through, all the way through you know, um, you know, radio and television and Nixon and gold, silver, Federal Reserve Standard, all the way through to today. And it, it led to a kind of a, um, a kind of a, well, the, with the advent of computers, it ended up leading to a kind of hyper-capitalism that got out of control a little bit too quickly. Until what, we're, what we were looking at by the 1990s was a world in which more money was being lent and borrowed by banks and speculators than was actually being used by people. Money lost its utility value because it had to serve a speculative value instead. 
right? The way money works is the Federal Reserve lends money to some big bank at a certain rate of interest. That big bank lends money to another bank at some higher rate of interest. That bank lends it to someone else at a higher rate of interest. And then that one lends it to you or me at an even higher rate of interest. If I want to start a business, right, I borrow $100,000 from the bank, right? I'm going to have to pay that money back in 10 years, 15 years. But instead of paying back $100,000, I'm going to have to pay back $300,000, right? That's the way interest works. Where do I get the other $200,000? from some other poor suckers who have each borrowed $100,000. For me to be able to pay back my $200,000 that I owe, in addition to my one, someone else has to lose that $100,000. Now the reason why that doesn't matter is either because though the banks will just lend more money into existence to become that 200 and the economy grows, but more importantly because the banks aren't in my real business. The banks are in the business of lending money. That's the business. I mean, that's the actual business. The majority of business in America is, and in the Western world, is that very lending of money. More money is made by this institution lending to that one, that one lending to that one, and that one lending to this one than any of the companies actually make. Look at the, the Fortune 500, those companies. Those are not companies. Those are names on debt. These are stories capable of garnering investment attention. This is not conspiracy theory. This is what they are. This is what they are. So you see a Murdoch story. That's a great story. He's got these satellites. He's got this. He's got that. Right? That's why the dot-com was such a powerful thing for NASDAQ. Right? These weren't companies that were going to make money, but these were great stories. NASDAQ stories, pets.com, everything.com. These were stories capable of generating investment from we stupid people. Because right? we all saw the internet happening and coming into our lives. What the internet allows, potentially, is the ability to create value on the periphery. I mean, not that we haven't had that all along, but it allows, I mean, you, you have all seen it. It allows any of us to actually make something and sell it anywhere, right? PayPal really was almost the first revolt in that direction. PayPal was a revolutionary concept. Originally, PayPal was going to be free. You know that? They weren't going to charge us anything to, to collect money from other people on PayPal. They were going to make money on the float just by holding on to the money for three days before they passed it out. What happened? The banking industry came and said, and they complained to regulators and said, you can't let PayPal do this. They're not a bank. If they're gonna, only we are allowed to do that. Why? We have the monopoly. But literally, we have the legal monopoly on the ability to make money off money. If people wanna make money off money, they've got to outsource that task to one of the Wall Street firms. Who, who manages their own, I don't mean manages their own 401k, but whose investments in their 401k are themselves or their friends or the things that they do? No, you invest, even if you do it yourself through E-Trade or Schwab, you're still giving the money to that fake investment world, to that other world in order to be part of this, this uh, um, phantom, what turned out to be a phantom growth equation. Now, the inability of our monetary scheme to reconcile with value creation from the periphery is analogous to the energy industry's inability to contend with a renewable resource. Right? Why can't we have a renewable resource in this country? Because how do you make money off a renewable resource? Turns out you can if you know what you're doing, but you don't make the same kind of money. You don't make the same kind of money that you make off a scarce commodity of a scarce resource. You don't make money the way we made it back in the Renaissance when we sent people to some place to get brown people to dig coal or gold out of place and bring it back home. Don't let them make anything with it. So you, I mean, that's why we had the revolution, you know. It wasn't really, we weren't mad at the king. We were mad at the British East India Trading Company. And we were mad at them because we would pick the cotton, but we weren't allowed to make stuff out of it. We had to ship it back to England, let them make stuff out of it, and then we bought it back from them. We weren't allowed to create value. And that was why we were so pissed off. Well, that's what America was supposedly for. That's why we weren't going to allow corporations here originally, but then 
we kind of did, and then we gave him personhood, and then we ended up where we are today. The crash that happened happened because all this money and all these people who only know how to make money by putting money in different places, by lending money, ran out of people to lend money to. That was the real problem. The reason why Bush created the Home Ownership Society in America, and, and in, in, a, in, a, in a almost a, a fake continuity to Clinton um, trying to let black people have houses, um, George Bush's Ownership Society was to try to create a new class of investments for banks that needed places to lend money. Right? So that's why they lowered mortgage standards. That's why they created all of these great ways for people to borrow money. And that's why also they raised the standard for bankruptcy. Right? People aren't allowed to go bankrupt anymore. Companies are still allowed to go bankrupt. And even if you do go bankrupt, you're still going to owe the bank money. Why? Because they saw this coming. They knew what they were doing. Right? And then they use what's called the, the, um, uh, what we now call the myth of the rational investor. They use the idea that people make rational economic decisions. We live in an economy. We all behave rationally. We all do the right thing to justify selling stuff to people that they didn't understand. And the things that they used, the advertising and the marketing they used to sell stuff to people that they didn't understand was all straight out of behavioral economics. Which is what? It's the study of how to convince people to buy stuff that's actually bad for them. How to take advantage of the illusions people have about how money works. So they knew perfectly well what they were doing. They lobbied, they spent, I forgot, was it $280 million lobbying Congress to change the bankruptcy law. They spent however many hundred million to repeal Glass-Steagall Act to sort of drop the glass wall between, or the, the Chinese wall between investment banks and regular banks. Really just to, as a last gasp, to push money in the way that they learned to make it. Now the problem is money just got too expensive and no one wanted to be in debt and there's nothing we can make anymore. There's nothing we can do anymore because, again, big companies that know how to use centralized currency and do things from a distance pretty much outsourced everything anyway to do, to do business by balance sheet. I get called in by companies all the time to consult on their communication strategies and almost none of them have anything to communicate. None of them actually do anything. It's really true. I, I got the, the, the last one I always like to talk about was this, this company that said they were an American television manufacturer. Right? And I know there are no American television manufacturers. Right? And I said, oh, so you, you, then you must design the televisions. And he said, well, no, actually, we don't. We outsource that to a company in, in San Francisco. So well, then you do the marketing? Well, yeah, but we actually gave that to an Omnicom company. So it's like, what do you do? What does this company do? Nothing. They can't, they can't take advantage of new communication strategies. They can't have a social network about their company. They can't be transparent because then we see in that there's nothing. They're depending on what? On marketing, on opacity, on basically billboards around their company to hide the fact that there is no there there. And when you have an entire uh, a, a nation of industries with no there there, that's when you get into trouble. We have a nation that both has no there there in our centralized industries and has an economy that's biased against you know, what McCain liked to call small business. It's biased against our creating value for ourselves without involving one or the other of a major centralized and expensive bureaucracy. Right? It's pure uh, uh, Khrushchevian uh, centralized, uh, centralized dictatorship. So along comes Obama. Then <laughs> a couple of weeks later, it was all better. <laughs> the great thing about Obama is that he did his campaign in a decentralized fashion. Right? He did his fundraising in a decentralized fashion. The question is, can he govern in a decentralized fashion? Ultimately, no. He cannot govern. He cannot move the country forward in a decentralized fashion. I wrote this piece back when he was still, before he had gotten his, uh, uh, the nomination, something like, uh, it was called Beyond Brand Obama. And what I was looking at was, what then? You know, what, what now? And I don't mean, I saw the revolutionary flyers out there from the, who was it, the socialist, uh, socialist party about how, you know, Obama's still going to be bad. We have to still have our revolution. Um, 
And while I'm not saying that, what I am saying is it's one thing to use decentralized tools and crowdsourcing to market yourself and raise money and get in office. It's another thing to do politics, to do actual governance by wiki, right? To actually have bottom-up legislation happen in a real way. And I would argue that centralized government cannot do that and probably shouldn't do that. If anyone does that, though, it is we who can do that. And we really can do that. And it doesn't look as lefty, radical, or uh, politically cool as we might want it to be. I mean, I've got three invitations now to attend post-Obama meetings with people with big names. I mean, you know, Joe Trippi and Bill Bradley and this one and that one. Everyone wants to go into a room and sort of dot-com style, sit down and come up with the YouTube website thing that ends up being how we do post-Obama legislation. And while that's a beautiful aspiration, I don't think that that is the task at hand. I think the task at hand is very, very immediate. Can we use this? Just like poor people use a blackout as a cue to break into the stores in their neighborhood and steal stuff. Can we use Obama's presidency, his election, as a cue to begin engaging civically, to begin engaging in our own communities, to begin engaging in the real world? And there's a restaurant in my town. A guy is a little organic restaurant. He needed more space. He wants to build a, a second location. And he got enough money to rent a second location. And then the meltdown happened. So he can't borrow money to expand a restaurant that everyone in town knows would work. So what he decided to do was develop something he called a VIP card. And I quickly helped him change it to, dot, to call it comfort dollars. The restaurant's called Comfort. And these are called comfort dollars. And if you go in and buy like $100 or more worth of comfort dollars, you get $120 worth of comfort dollars to spend at his restaurant. So people, some people in this town are rich, are buying $1,000, $5,000, $10,000 worth of comfort dollars because they know over time they're going to spend this money at this restaurant, right, or have them cater or something, whatever. And they get back a 20% return on their money right away, which is better than they're going to do in any mutual fund, in any bank, with any CD. And he's getting the money because he's paying back the money in food. He's getting the money cheaper than he could get it from any bank. So what's going on? What is that? This is basically a local currency. This is a way for me to invest in my community instead of outsourcing my investment elsewhere. It's a way for me to get 20% back. It's a way for me to get a second restaurant in my town that I can experience and want to have, get two more people to work in my town. And this is not hard. This is not rocket science. All we need Obama to do at that point, and I don't mean to sound Ron Paulish on this, all we need Obama to do is get out of the way. All we need Obama to do is to get rid of the regulations that were created to prevent this from happening. Right? What are the obstacles? Oh, no, taxation. How do we tax this? Oh, is someone going to challenge this because it's a, not a, a legal form of currency? Is this now counted as counterfeit money? Does he need a special license? Does he need to this? Does he need to that? You know, what about the town? And there's a ton of them where they're trying to develop energy alternatives that are then told that there's some obsolete, archaic um, oil industry regulation that prevents them from generating any grid power in their town. You know, that's the kind of stuff that government can do, that they can help with. You know, that's the, kind, that's the kind of funding you can even get. That last little bit of money that you need to do that R&D to get that thing actually working is something you can look for, alone for. But, um, but no, there's, there's so much um, legacy that Obama and any administration is going to have to deal with. There's a legacy of social programs and welfares and Medicaids and Medicares and things like that that are so fatuity right now, um, that, that that's enough to engage any, any fabulous administration to try to unwind that stuff over the next 10, 20 years. That's enough to keep them busy. That and sort of reestablishing civil relationships with the rest of the world, coming up with other farms. That's a bunch of busy stuff. We are going to have to learn to take care of ourselves while all this goes on. You understand that you are not 
the first, but you're not going to be the, the last generation either who has nothing awaiting you in terms of social services when you get old. You're going to have to work this out yourselves. And the way you're going to have to work this out is by connecting locally to real people. It's been done before in Japan. When the height of the recession happened, no one had money to take care of their elderly. And the elderly, they were all living in different places. What they did was create a complementary currency these elder care dollars, where I could spend three hours washing one person's grandmother in my town, I would earn three hours of credit so that someone would take care of my grandma in their town. And hundreds of millions of dollars or yens worth of health care was provided this way in Japan, so much so, and the system was so good that old people now prefer getting their health care through those networks than through professional health care. Why? Because these are real people helping other people who have grandmas just like them, because not all of it is the highest skilled labor, because it's really just getting up your ass and doing something. I mean, it's convincing people in your neighborhood, why is it better, you know, or why is it worse to spend $20,000 on a private school education for your kid than it is to spend $20,000 of your time making your public school better? Why is it worse? Because if you spend $20,000 making your public school better, you're making your public better. You're making your town better. You're making other kids better. You're making more friends for your kid. And using less gas, not sending them on a thing, and not giving money to God knows what obsolete, bizarre institution. Yeah? Here in New York, even the local government is more than a lot of countries. So there's enough local problems. You know, trying to make your public school better. I mean, Jesus, good luck with that. Well, actually, I know a bunch of people. I mean, I mean, charter schools have a bad name now because right now charter schools are basically ways for upper middle class people to create schools that are good enough for their kids to go to, right? And they come up with a lot of clever ways of preventing the charter school from becoming but there's open. New ones but there are. Too, up yeah, it isn't that it isn't that hard, and you can you can fairly easily tweak the sort of neo libertarian vibe of. The, the, the more Republican side of school administration and make them think that what you're doing is kind of like vouchers, even though what it is is, is restoration of public education. Okay, but there's not too many Republicans in the New York school system. Well, then, you, then you're in luck. You know, <laughs> then you're in luck. But I mean, what's his name? You know, uh, 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 Klein yeah. and his whole thing. It's, he's, he's tricky. But it's not impossible. It really isn't impossible. Even just spending your time I mean, I do see it happen. Usually there's one school that's really good, and then what happens is people move near that school. It's like the Park Slope thing. 321 is really good. Then sort of 107 and PS39, people who can't afford to live in 321, then go, well, maybe we can try to make our school better. Six or seven parents in one public school is enough to actually make a significant difference. It's more a matter of people don't want to feel like they're going to be the only one and then sacrifice the, their child on the altar of their good lefty intentions. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's a hard one, which is why you need a team. And to get a team, you need to know your neighbors. And to get to know your neighbors, you've got to meet them. I mean, so it's all, it's all that. It's that reconnecting to the local. And you're only going to want to meet your neighbors. I mean, I've got stories in, in this next book I'm writing. People stopped going to PTA meetings because they started buying their drugs at the Walmart. And the wife of the guy that ran the pharmacy they used to go to is one of the heads of the PTA. And they don't want to be seen at the PTA meeting. So each of our desocializing decisions tends to have this ripple effect to other decisions. Does that didn't make sense? All right, the PTA is like the parent-teacher association in town. So if I live in a town and I go to the PTA meetings, and at each PTA meeting I see the wife of the local druggist, who I've been going to for many years. Now Walmart comes into town, I stop buying drugs at the local druggist, I'm embarrassed. So I stop going to that meeting too, because I don't want to see her. And I actually don't even go down that street where her thing is, maybe she'll think I moved, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so once you disconnect from one thing, you start disconnecting from the others. And it is really hard in the short term, as we get more poor, it's really hard to make decisions to not go to the Walmart and just spend more money. Why would you spend more money to go to a druggist? You can't do it unless everybody's doing it. Because otherwise, it doesn't make short-term financial sense for you as an individual. It makes long-term financial sense for you as a community, though. And that's... You know, that's the trickier thing to negotiate. And that's what a truly great world leader can do when they, they come into the, the you know, presidency of a country. You know, that's, that's what we're hoping that we as a people can muster using uh, uh, Obama as the chazan, if you will, more than the rabbi. 
You know, the chazan is the cantor at a sermon. The, the, almost a, 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 I hate to be Oprah about it, but in some sense we need a spiritual leader on that order. How do we muster the, um, I don't mean God spiritual, but I mean to get the spirit, to get the enthusiasm. How do we do that? What gives us permission to look at one another and say, are you happy about what happened? I mean, I'm still embarrassed to go into the, the class or to go into them and say, this is really cool, isn't it? I'm still afraid to do that because what if it's not, you know, won't get fooled again. And... Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So it seems to me that, um, you know, you're talking a lot about local forms of politics, collaboration, um, economies, um, but it also seems, and you know, it's interesting because I would say in Europe there's a lot more of that going on. Yeah. And one of the reasons is because they do have socialized medicine. You can work part-time and not worry about having huge medical yeah. bills, right? Um, same is the case for Canada. So it seems, and you, you sort of talked a little bit about healthcare, but I would say that is one thing, like roads, that you would not want kind of a local, that you sort of want scaled so that everyone can have uniformly, so that you can create the time conditions so that you can be like, you know what, I'm just going to work 30 hours a week or 20 hours a week, as opposed to I'm going to work full time yeah. so that I don't go into debt. So do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It seems to be there's, there's certain things that you don't want at that local scale precisely to create the conditions so that people can engage. Right. Or if maybe you could put health on the local scale and illness on the, on the centralized one. There are, ways, there are ways for us to become, to become healthier. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, because these are some big ticket items. You know, I mean, not every town can afford or should afford its MRI machine or its <laughs> heart research center and all that. So things that are, or, or its own tanks. You know, so some of these things really are better done in larger collective federalized, federalized models, for sure. But if we took the ones that actually were and separated them out from the ones that weren't, they'd be, uh, that'd be a start. The other great thing about Europe is the, the Europe was not designed to promote long-distance trade and dependence on fast food and supermarkets and shipping industry and all that. I mean, in Europe, you still, you have a job, you walk home for lunch and come back to work. You know, that doesn't work. Our country wasn't designed to function that way. So um, it is a lot harder for us. I mean, our country was designed eventually so that you could leave the city and not see how the people, and not experience the conditions that your factories created. You know, that's, that's sort of how we got, how we built this. I mean, originally we sent the slaves out of the city so we wouldn't have to look at the way they lived. Then we went out of the city and kind of sent them back in. But so it sort of it went back and forth a couple of times. But this disconnect, you know, this, this, this disconnect is built into the architecture of our, of our world, the structure of our economy, and the psychology of our people. And reversing that, it, it's going to be slower than it might seem. Is someone here? Yeah. Um, so some things are better to have localized any ideal sense of anything or not, but by what rubric do you weigh those different things? Well, I'm not administrating the entire world. I mean, I think in some ways, we, we, I don't think we make a list. I think we start seeing what works in different circumstances. I think what we do is we start attending to needs that we actually care about, rather than, especially as computer people, trying to attend to meta needs. I want to have the, I want to build the website where people tend to their local needs. No, what you want to do is attend to a need and see if you can start fulfilling it. You know, my friend who, who's one of the people who started Traffic Alternatives, you know, he, the need that he saw originally was there were too many car horns in his neighborhood, waking him up every morning. Then he realized too many car horns because there's not enough bike lanes. And he became an avid biker, and now he's part of the commission to promote bike lanes in Brooklyn and Manhattan and here and there. That's what he does. That's his day, is getting bike lanes. Um, and it does, and, and I'm not yet a biker because I'm scared to get killed because there's not enough bike lanes. But, um, <laughs> but that's something that does seem to work um, locally. And, see, and you know, and see, how that, see how that goes. I think it's something that can happen more organically rather than, than planning it out. I mean, some things, yeah, are obviously going to be more centralized until we figure out. I mean, we could certainly have local acupuncture clubs, you know, certain technologies that are passed person to person or, or learned. But, you know, your local heart surgery club is probably more difficult. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, commenting on the European thing, everything always keeps reading on the other side, right? I mean, yeah. Michael Moore would even have us believe that Helga in Cuba is, you know, so much more clean. Um, oh, yeah, I saw the comfort dollars in the TV thing, by the way. I didn't know that uh, you, you helped do it. That was great. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, is being willing not to take any credit for things. You know, it really is. The, the, the energy you spend trying to make sure you get credit for it usually kills the thing. You know, and it's, it's I mean, he gave me a free carrot cake. <laughs> you know, and that was beautiful, but that's the way I did it. I did what it, I mean. Was it? What town was it, by the way? Hastings on Hudson. Ah. Which is a weird lefty little Berkeley like pocket. With a lot of, of money. Well, it depends. Half of it's got money, half of it doesn't. It's an interesting little town. But yeah, but the downtown's bankrupt. I mean, yeah, but that's it's been since the malls, you know? Yeah. Uh, one more yeah. um, I kind of fear that, you know, even if you realize some of the ideas of open source democracy, is that, you know, some of these bigger, older institutions will hijack it. I mean, take a look at what happened in the internet. You don't have community emails. You go to Google for everything, for example. You know, what are your thoughts on that? You go to Google for everything because the kinds of things that we're still doing with our time are the kinds of things that Google answers. You know, where do I get a, you know, a blue 40 watt light bulb for a reverse condenser, blah, blah, blah. Mm. You know, Google. Um, you know, I'm, and it's interesting, it's like there's a huge community of people willing to dedicate their time to researching on Wikipedia, yet surprisingly few people willing to give any money so that they can't even keep their own servers up. Right? There's everyone's willing to hit it, but no one's willing to give up. Yeah. I think a more salient answer is we actually did do email communities. I mean, the whole history of email are small email communities that build up to the point where they're robust enough for large companies with money to come in and make them off or they can't refuse it. Well they can refuse it. They decide to sell it. I mean, it's like, so, and that's, you know, and that's not bad in itself. The fact is the internet almost has the functionality it did in 1994, again. You know, the web was a huge leap in dysfunctionality for the, for the internet. The internet was a two-way, very level playing field. The web was opaque. The web did to the internet kind of what, what Catholicism did to Judaism, if you will. It put a lot of pictures and, and ritual and saints and distance away from this beautiful text-only back-and-forth argument. And then it gave answers to something that was about questions. For the internet to return to questions, we need that two-way thing. And now we have interfaces built on top of the web that are allowing conversations to take place again. So I don't think, I don't think it's all lost. I think it's just what our priorities as a society were. You know, the, once we saw we can make money on this thing, you know, the whole shareware thing, uh, uh, well, it didn't die down. It was just we, it became less central to what was going on, a less central story. Internet stories were found on the business page rather than the, the social page. That doesn't mean they're not still going on. Right, and I think it's really interesting because the media focuses on things like MySpace and Facebook. But for example, the largest nonprofit ISP in the world um, is something that has 300,000 users and is never featured in the New York Times and these sorts of things. What we don't it? see them. Uh, it's called Rise Up Technologies. Uh -huh. And it's uh, only universities are larger in terms of nonprofit ISP. There's all sorts of really interesting projects going on that just don't get play in the mainstream media. And perhaps that's a good thing, too. Because uh, it keeps them from getting... Exactly. And Rise Up has uh, actually refused interviews over and over again from, you know, big-time newspapers for various reasons. But part of the reason is they don't want the attention to go right. to them because that will put pressure on them to change. But right. we also have things like Meetup. Absolutely. I mean, they started charging money for groups, so we'll see. But we got to, I mean, everything costs. What are you going to do? Got to pay the lighting bill. So this is obviously a great conversation, but unfortunately our time is up, so I just want to thank the... Well, thank you. I didn't mean to be pessimistic. I meant to be optimistic. It's all good. It's all good. It's just, it's a matter of our micro decisions, right, rather than, than the big ones. Obama can't do it for you. But you can meditate upon him to get the inner strength you <laughs> need. Thank you.